Michael D'Antonio, welcome back to WBAI. The author of Truth About the Truth About Trump joins us to discuss his book, which we're offering as a premium in this fund drive. The Truth About Trump is, uh, according to the New York Times Review of Books, uh, admirably straightforward, even-handed, but nonetheless damning. Welcome back, Michael. Thanks, Paul. All right, damning. Well, I've been reading a lot of your book, and I've had a chance now to uh, to see how Mr. Trump, at least in the early part of his career, uh, came to prominence by uh, manipulating basically his family name and a relatively small uh, but substantial bankroll, and turn it into turn himself into one of the most famous people in America. And in his own words, one of the richest, although he might not be one of the richest. Um, Donald Trump, what kind of guy is he? How would you describe him? How does your book describe Donald Trump overall? I mean, what kind of man is he if I were to meet him? How would I how would I judge him based on your at least, I think, five times you met with him and talked to him? Yes. And, you know, you chose the right word there, uh, manipulate. The, this is a fellow who is all about manipulation, and the goal has always been to make himself as famous as possible, even if that meant doing uh, infamous things. He, he wasn't much concerned about whether people liked him in the main or disliked him. He just wanted them to know his name. And so if you were to meet him, you'd think, well, this guy is a performer. He's He's all about um, getting you to like him. He, he'll he give you the big smile and uh, joke around a little bit. Uh, but he's very disinterested, actually, in other people. Mm-hmm. So I probably spent 10 hours with him, and he has no idea about where I live, whether I have children, whether I'm married, um, where I'm from. He actually, I don't think, ever asked a single question in the time we spent together. It was all about him. Uh, And, of course, that was my purpose, to learn about him. But I don't think I've ever met someone who had absolutely no interest in the people around him. And I really did feel that that was the case with uh, Donald Trump. What's he about? What's he? What's his goal in life? What What does he want to do with his life? Well, the goal was notoriety, um, and he understood, I think, very well that fame could be translated into money and power. That hasn't always been the case. You know, our uh, press hadn't allowed very many people to become very famous until the 20th century, and even then, it wasn't until television came along that people could really cash in. Mm -hmm. And he saw that if he could be a famous businessman, this would uh, actually be good for sales of uh, real estate properties and later on any kind of consumer good that he wanted to sell. So the idea was to become very famous, to turn that into money, and ultimately, if power came, that was a good thing, too. And money is power, of course. He wielded great power over the people who worked for him, and the way that he bullied people to uh, get his real estate deals through indicated that he had power there as well. Now, I'm it not seemed... sure he ever thought he'd be president. <laughs> I, I, I think that idea didn't really become serious until 2015 and even then i think he was surprised when he finally won yes and uh i think we were talking last time about Mm -hmm. how that incident at the correspondence dinner where president obama and other comedians just you know really uh gave him a hard time to say the least might have been the place where a man of his bruisable ego uh decided that he was going to get his comeuppance yeah he's awfully uh, sensitive for somebody who's been in the public eye for so long and is to some degree uh, bulletproof. You know, what could you do to Donald Trump, really? He he had more than enough money to defend against any lawsuit, uh, and he would sue others into oblivion if they tried to harm him. Mm-hmm. So really, the only thing that was vulnerable was his ego. Mm-hmm. And it's incredibly vulnerable. Even today, I mean, we see as he's occupied the Oval Office that he can't stop talking about 
things people say about him. Uh, the Russia controversy is a big example of this. He should keep his mouth shut, you know, for both political and legal reasons, but he can't let it go. Does it make you think that he re really didn't expect to be or really want to be president, to be in the public eye in that way where he could be held accountable on a 24-hour basis was a big mistake maybe for him? Well, the accountability issue is, is a problem for him. When uh, the last health care bill failed, he said, well, we're going to let Obamacare uh, crumble, and I, it's not going to be on me, and it's not going to be on the Republicans. How can you and say that? I, I can't imagine anybody saying that, it, it, President of the United States or, or anybody in serious business saying that. It's almost impossible to say that. I mean, you're responsible. You're on the watch. Your watch, you're responsible. Well, it, he actually had said in 2014 that, of course, President Obama is responsible for the, everything that happened on his watch. So, you know, that just goes to the way that Trump says everything and nothing. You know, he'll speak at length, and then when you go back to review the transcript or your notes, you discover he really didn't make a coherent point, or he'll take every position on an issue uh, in a matter of days. Uh, sometimes in the same conversation, he'll take mm -hmm. opposing positions on a single issue. It's just... Right. He can't uh, be trusted. People are just saying right now, on, the, on all the news media except maybe Fox News, you hear over and over again, we can't, you know, in, re, re, in his response to things that happened in Congress, things that happened with the Russia investigation, we can't believe what he says from his past... It's come. It's already coming back to haunt him. He's barely be in, been in six months, and they're already saying. I mean, we can't really trust what the he can tweet all he wants, but we have to get another source. And I've never heard of a president, even Richard Nixon, where that happened. No, uh, it, Nixon didn't face that problem until the end, uh, until he was about to walk out on the White House lawn and get in the helicopter for the last time. Uh, by then, he had said, I'm not a crook, and everyone realized he was. But that was six years into his presidency. Uh, uh, six this months. president, or six months in, and <laughs> no one believes him. Right. I want to talk for a minute or two about these Russian allegations. And uh, I mean, Donald Trump seems like the guy who might get himself through his contacts with construction companies and cement uh, suppliers, as you spoke, through his connections with political figures and his family's connections with people like Abe Beam that helped him get a start on things. Uh, he's that kind of guy. I, I don't see him as a, the espionage type. You know, I, I think you're right. I, I think that this... You're right, because it was in your book, The Truth About Trump, <laughs> which we're offering here on WBAI as a premium. But thank you. Well, but, you know, this controversy, and that's really, I think, the point that you're making, probably has more to do with money than it does with um, state secrets or uh, somehow plotting in order to uh, do something uh, unpatriotic or mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I don't imagine. That. But he, he he would do what he thought was patriotic. I or you or others might say that's not very patriotic, or maybe it is. But uh, uh, he himself, I doubt, would think of himself as uh, anything other than a flag-waving American patriot in his own way, in his own way. Well, mind. and the, really the reason, the word I should have used was treason. Um, I don't think he intends to commit treason in this uh, scandal. I think he intends to protect himself. And that there is a problem here with his relationship with Russia or with certain oligarchs. What do you think that problem is? What's going on as far as these oligarchs and Donald Trump? Does it have a history before this period? Well, it does. You know, this Bayrock development of Trump Soho that took place at the beginning of this century was financed in part by money that was laundered through uh, shell corporations in Amsterdam and that seems to have originated in the former Soviet republics. This is pretty obviously oligarch money. Uh, there's another source of funds in Iceland called FL Group and they're being investigated now to see where that money originated. And you also have the fellow who paid close to $100 million for a house uh, Trump sold in Florida. He's an oligarch. Um, 
some of the buildings that Trump has sold uh, apartments in, uh, you can hear Russians spoken in the hallways because so many people wanted to park money in the United States and saw real estate as a good option. Could he be the first president who gets in trouble, I'll, I'll, I wouldn't say indicted, but uh, for money laundering or being involved or knowing about money laundering going on with his properties and things like that? Well, there was money laundering going on all around American real estate uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union. I suspect it's still going on. I um, see. And a lot of it involved expensive uh, projects in New York City. So, you know, there's, I think, a lot that will be discovered by the special counsel, Robert Mueller, who's hired people who are very good at forensics and finance. Um, I'm sure they're traveling around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, looking for records, um, examining accounts, and if what they discover becomes public, I think it'll be quite um, illuminating. Using the vast investigative powers of the United States Department of Justice, which, uh, you know, as great as, as we are as investigative reporters, uh, takes it to a new level. It does. I was just looking today at a document uh, from the Watergate era, and there was Bill Weld, who was the governor of Massachusetts, and I think he was the libertarian uh, vice presidential candidate this time around. He was talking about the incredible power of subpoena and how dramatic that can be. Uh, he worked on the House Committee investigating Watergate. Um, it's a bad thing for a president when someone armed with subpoena power starts rooting around in records mm -hmm. and can summon people to testify under oath. I want to order. sum up in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, first, how how did Donald Trump get himself in all this hot water? I mean, why do people care about what his bu private business dealings? What has he done as president that's been so uh, – that's angered so many people and turned so many people against him? What well, about his I, personality would commit to that? Well, there are two f topics there. One is – you know, what's put him in such hot water, and obviously it's the Russian meddling in the election and his refusal to take it seriously for so long. The thing about his personality is that he is happy to fight with almost anyone, and he almost assumes that people won't fight back. And the mistake is to believe that a humiliated opponent is vanquished forever. These senators and members of Congress who he treated so poorly and continues to treat poorly, have their own power base, and, mm -hmm. and they're not going to stay down forever. And now Senator McCain has the ultimate sympathy card to play, and it's going to really make the guy who uh, dismissed his uh, heroism in combat as, um, well, we haven't revisited that yet. Uh, Michael D'Antonio, just to sum up, um, the truth about Trump. What made you decide to write this incredible book uh, that tells so much about Trump in just 200, 350 uh, pages? Uh, what, what led you to write this book about Trump? Well, I recognized, as did the publisher who came to me with the idea, that this was an iconic American figure. Like him or loathe him, he's uh, very important when it comes to our society. And it just turned out that he was going to be the guy running for president. That didn't arise until I was almost finished. Um, but it, it was a timely and a wonderful happenstance for mm -hmm. me, and I hope that people who read the book will feel really enlightened about him. Right. You talked to Trump. How many, remind us how many times you talked to Trump, Mr. We Trump. We had five sessions. Uh, once he figured out he couldn't control me, that was the end of it. Um, and but th I got a lot out of him. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't there a lot of problems you've had since then? Hasn't he complained about the book and threatened you since this book came out? Well, he has. You know, what's funny is he had this attorney, Michael Cohen, who has run into his own trouble, uh, phoned me and threatened me uh, in in all kinds of profane ways. But you know, the book was published. Uh, they couldn't stop it. Uh, we didn't let them see it before it came out. And there's nothing in it that isn't so well documented that uh, I can't stand behind it. And as a result, they've there's there's been nary a peep uh, mm -hmm. since it actually was published. All right. 
Very good. Thank you, Michael D'Antonio, for joining us again on WBAI. And we'll probably have you on again, yet again, to discuss this uh, unveiling uh, of the truth about Trump. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Paul.